Hey, American Literature friends. We are back. This is going to be the first of a pair of videos about Sharon Olds and her poetry. In this video, we are going to go over a little bit about her bi biographical information, uh, and then her poem, Sex Without Love. I go back to May 1937 and Little Things, which are all in the book. And then in the other video, we will get into the other poems that are online linked in D2L. We'll, we'll also get into a little bit of information about the response topic in this video and a little bit of information about Sharon Olds as a confessional poet. It is probably worth starting right there because as they tell you in the book, Sharon Olds herself rejects the traditional uh, title of confessional poetry. We have talked about confessional poetry already this semester, if, in case you don't remember, is a movement in poetry gained popularity in the 1950s and 1960s. So Sharon Olds, if she fits into that genre, she's a second wave confessional poet. She's a second generation because those poets were writing in the 1950s and 1960s, the Sylvia Plath, the Ann Sextons, those people. She didn't start writing until the late 1970s, 1980s, so she clearly belongs to a generation after those people. But, peop but many scholars and critics fit her into this sort of new generation of confessional poetry, a new way of doing confessional poetry. Uh, it refers to poetry that features public and sometimes painful displays of private and personal matters. And many of Sharon Olds' poems are these sort of personal disclosures. They're intimate, they're domestic, which is why people see her as belonging to this tradition, even if she herself doesn't like to be pigeonholed in there. In confessional poetry, the poet often seems to address the audience directly. That's another reason people read Sharon Olds as a confessional poet, because you have that intimate feeling where it feels in many of her poems like she is addressing you directly, without the intervention of a persona or a created poetic voice. They talk in the book about her biographical information. She is still alive. They say in the book, like Walt Whitman, who's probably the most famous American poet, Sharon Olds celebrates the body and writes about it without shame. And like Whitman, her candor, straightforwardness, arouses a mixed response among contemporary readers. Some people find Sharon Olds' poems with their close observations about sexuality, family life, and family pathology disturbingly graphic, while many others find them moving and brave. And once you understand that sentence, that close observations about sexuality, family life, and family pathology. A lot of Sharon Old's poems are about one of those three things, some sort of sensual experience or sexuality, family life, like being a wife, uh, being a mother, those kinds of things, and family pathology, sort of connections and troubles within people's family, even if it's your extended family. A lot of her poetry is about one of those three things. In her poem, Sharon Olds lays out the domestic territory of life, that, that sort of traditionally feminine domestic experiences, things that happen in the house or in the areas that are traditionally controlled by women, which extends to motherhood, daughterhood, and the body's life of sensation. That idea about the life of sensation has always, to me, felt important in understanding Sharon Olds' poetry because as much as people like to read her work as sensual or sexual, a lot of her work is just simply sensory, like it has to do with the five senses and what the five senses are feeling um, and her unique perspective on what they're feeling and how they're feeling it. Old's examination of intimate subjects has distinctive quality of fascination and even tenderness. That idea of being fascinated with some, I, you see something or you feel something and you become sort of fixed on it and you get fascinated and almost like you can't stop, you're staring at it, you can't stop looking at something or thinking about something or feeling something. There you get a lot of that in her poems too. Because many of her poems focus on intimate experiences, uh, it's perhaps too easy to assume that the work is simply autobiographical or confessional. This is where she talks about she doesn't see herself as being confessional in that second paragraph in the book. Um, a description that she herself rejects, even though she calls her work apparently very personal. Uh, she grew up in Berkeley, California, attended St Berkeley right there near San Francisco. She attended Stanford, if you know Stanford in California. She has a PhD. Um, she came to the East Coast. And she really has never left the East Coast, although she is clearly, in many ways, identified as a California writer. 
Um, she went to school at Columbia in New York City. She got her PhD there. And then uh, she has worked there and she still works and teaches in the writing program at NYU, New York University. Um, so she is a New York City person now, although she originally came from and grew up in uh, that, that area around San Francisco. Let's get into just a second. Uh, we've covered confessional poetry. We've got a little bit of biographical information about her. Let's jump back and look at the Sharon Olds response topic in the computer, just to have it in mind as we go through the poems. In her poetry, she often finds love and beauty in surprising places. And that is one of the sort of hallmarks of her work is that this goes back to what they call in the book that sort of tenderness and fascination. She finds love and beauty in surprising places or by looking at familiar things, your, your, your father, your daughter, those kinds of things, familiar topics and experiences in new and surprising ways. In this paper, select a poem or two, two at most, by Sharon Olds and investigate the ways that love or beauty is constructed. So what that's really asking you, the ways that love or beauty is constructed, the ways that she gets fascinated with things, the ways that she finds things beautiful or attractive or appealing, the ways that she makes things that might not be traditionally appealing or attractive or beautiful makes them feel appealing or beautiful. Think about issues such as where the love or beauty comes from, the sources of, of beauty, what experiences, objects it is attached to, like who is beautiful, what is beautiful, what is fascinating, and if there are any problems or imperfections with the experience. Imperfections is something she comes back to a lot too, that things are imperfect but still worth love, or imperfect, not perfect, but still, but still beautiful. That's an idea that's really... That's a theme that she keeps coming back to and an idea that seems important to her. So we are going to jump into Sex Without Love first, which is one of her more famous... It is an older poem of hers, but it remains one of the poems that she is most famous for. And the title of it sort of gives it away um, because what this poem is really about at its core is the difference between physical attraction or lust and love because what this poem is the, the question that this poem is asking is how can people engage in this physical activity and that idea of physical activity is important in this poem without some kind of emotional attachment or emotion somehow getting involved and she you see the poem starts off by asking that how do they do it the ones who make love without love that idea of love without love is important in this because She's, she's setting these two different meanings of love. One, this sort of physical attraction and engagement beside the other one, which is this sort of emotional attachment. Beautiful as dancers. Again, the first image of several that you get in this poem of physical activity and people doing other physical activities like dancing. Beautiful as dancers gliding over each other like ice skaters over the ice. And so... One of the things you get in this poem is this idea that people having sex without love is just like any other kind of physical performance, almost like athletic performance, like dancing or ice skating. Fingers hooked inside each other's bodies, faces red as steak. You know, you're exercising, your face gets red. Wine, wet as to children at birth whose mothers are going to give them away. How do they come to the, come to the God, come to the still waters, you know, have this sort of deep, intimate, physical interaction and not love the ones who came there with them. And this idea becomes important because sex without love is in some ways this lonely experience because you're just there doing this physical activity alone because you don't have that emotion without that emotional connection. Not love the one who came there with them. Light rising slowly as steam off their joined skin. These are the true religious the purest, the pros, the ones who will not accept a false messiah, love the priest instead of the God. They do not mistake the lover for their own pleasure. Again, you get that sort of exercise. What's happening in this sex without love experience is just a physical experience, a physical engagement, almost like going for a run. Uh, they are like the great runners. They know they are alone with the road surface, the cold, the wind, the fit of their shoes, their overall cardiovascular health. Just factors. Not emotional attachment, just physical factors. Like the partner in the bed and not the truth, 
which is the single body alone in the universe against its own best time. Again, like running and you're trying to run faster, get your best time in a race or something like that. And so what you finally get at the end of this poem is the idea that physical intimacy without emotional intimacy is just is like going for is like some going for a run or some physical activity where ultimately you're you're just out there alone doing your own thing because without that emotional connection it's it's just a physical sensation. The next one that I want to talk about is probably Sharon Olds' most famous poem. It is called I Go Back to May 1937. And it is not famous because of her or, or anything in particular. It is famous because it was it's featured in a movie called Into the Wild. And one of the characters in that movie reads the whole poem out loud to another character. And because of that movie, and it was famous when it came out, although it's, it's, it's old, it's been out for a few years now, um, because when Into the Wild, the movie came out, it made this poem famous, and, and that fame has sort of clung to it, even though the, the movie may not be known to you anymore. Uh, this poem is about if sex without love is this more general consideration of physical intimacy, that sensory experience without emotional attachment, this poem is much more personal because you get to feel, this poem is clearly about the speaker's parents and the feeling that them getting married wasn't the right choice for them or wasn't the best choice they could have made but it's a necessary choice because her parents necessarily had to get together and get married even if the marriage wasn't happy even even if they should have forgotten each other and gone and found somebody else well if they had gone and done that the speaker wouldn't exist and so she sort of accepts the reality the speaker in the poem accepts this reality that however much trouble her parents had with each other or however unhappy their marriage was it needed to happen for her to exist i see them standing at the formal gates of their colleges i see my father strolling out under the ochre sandstone arch the red tiles glinting like bent plates of blood behind his head i see my mother a few light books at her hip standing at the pillar made of tiny bricks the wrought iron gate still open behind her its sword tips gl aglow in the May air. They are about to graduate. They are about to get married. They are kids. They are dumb. And you get, there's somewhere around here is the first section of this poem, and then the poem turns a little bit. But this first part of the poem, she is just showing you her parents right before they graduate from college together. It's May. They're about to graduate from college together, and they're about to get married. They're about to go from one part of their life to another part of their life, the part of their life where they are adults together, the kind of adults who then go on and have kids. And so they are at this moment where they are leaving one part of their life and going into another part, and in that other part, they are about to get married and make this decision that they may regret and that the speaker sort of regrets for them because she has the knowledge of what's coming and how difficult the marriage may be, the trouble that they may have being together. They are kids. They are dumb. All they know is they are innocent. They would never hurt anybody except they are about to hurt each other and their children because of this decision to get married. I want to go up to them, even though at this point she didn't exist. I want to go up to them and say, stop. Don't do it. She's the wrong woman. He's the wrong man. And so, again, you get that sentiment. She, she wants to say, look, if y'all only knew what was coming, you wouldn't do this. You're going to do things you cannot imagine you would ever do. You're going to do bad things to children. You're going to suffer in ways you have not heard of. You're going to want to die. And so she says, look, you have no clue. You're so young. You feel like your whole life's ahead of you. And it is ahead of you. But there's stuff coming that's, that's pain and trouble and struggle that you can't even guess at. I want to go up to them there in the late May sunlight and say it. Her hungry, pretty face turning to me. Her pitiful, beautiful, untouched body. His arrogant, handsome face turning to me. His pitiful, beautiful, untouched body. And so she knows them. She sees them in this vision. Before she was born or even thought of, she sees her parents in this vision as these young, innocent people who have no clue where life is going to take them. And they're, they're young and innocent and beautiful. And I, um, but I don't do it. I want to live. And so she says, 
she, you know, if she could go back in time and say, look, you have no clue what's coming and how much struggle and trouble, this may not even be the right person. You might want to rethink marrying this person. And then she thinks, but, but I can't do it because if I did it, I wouldn't be here. I want to live. I take them up like the male and female paper dolls and bang them together at the hips. You know, she, she sort of bangs them together at the hips, them making love. Like chips of flint, as if to strike sparks from them. They have to get together. They have to make her. Um, and so she has this vision of however much she, she wishes, she suspects that they might not be the right person for each other. They have to get together because they have to get together and get married and make her. Like chips of flint, as if to strike sparks from them, I say, do what you are going to do, and I will tell about it. And so she's, she knows that what happened has to always happen because that's what made her and made her the adult that can tell their story. Good parts, bad parts, all the parts. For her to be alive, to tell her story, and to tell about them, they have to make this choice to be together. The next poem that I want to talk about in the last poem that I'm going to talk about in this particular video is Little Things by Sharon Olds. And this poem, this is a good, it's good that we got these three together because you get sex without love, this sort of general expression of emotion. And then you get, I go back to May 1937, uh, which is this more, it's focused on a child and her parents. This poem is focused on children from the perspective of parents, not parents from the perspective of children. So in some ways, it's a little bit of the opposite of go back to, I go back to May 1937, because this is her thinking about um, her children after they've gone to camp during the day, gone to summer camp. So this is Little Things by Sharon Olds. After she's gone to camp, in the early evening, I clear our girls' breakfast dishes from the rosewood table, and I find a dinky crystallized pool of maple syrup, the grain standing there, round in the night. And so the little girl has gone to camp, the mom is cleaning up after her, and the little girl has spilled a little drop of syrup on the table, um, probably from breakfast, from like pancakes or waffles or something like that. And the mom stands there and looks at this little leftover trace that the girl was there this little piece of evidence this little artifact that her that her daughter was there i rub it with my finger as if i could read it this raised dot of amber sugar and this time when i think of my father i wonder why i think of my father of the vulcan blood red glass in his hand or his black hair gleaming like a broken open coal i think i learned to love the little things about him because of all the big things i could not love and so she thinks, she looks at this little dot of maple syrup that her daughter left behind, and she remembers her own dad, who in some ways was not lovable, they didn't have the best relationship, but there were little things that he did for her and little parts of him that she could connect with in love, and that's how she has learned to understand love, and that's how she, under, and that's how she loves her little girls, through these little artifacts and little moments and little pieces. It would be wrong to. So when I fix on this image of resin, or sweep together with the heel of my hand a pile of my son's sunburn peels like insect wings. This is often the part of this poem that people remember and, and people are often grossed out because she sees, she takes that image of the little drop of maple syrup that the daughter left on the table and puts it beside, if you've ever had a sunburn and you know you get those little skin, those little skin peels that peel off and they're just little like almost tissue paper thin little pieces of burnt skin. Um, she, you got the drop of maple syrup and the little pile of the, the sun's sunburn peels, but that what those things have in common, one sort of sweet, one sort of gross, is that they are both leftovers, artifacts of her children, one of the daughter, one of the son, where I peeled his back the night before camp. I'm doing something I learned early to do. I'm paying attention to small beauties. And that's what this poem is really about. Little things, small beauties, the, the little things that make you happy, the little pieces of the people that you love, the little artifacts of the people that you love that you look at and think, uh, you know, I've got to wipe this up or I've got to clean this up. But it's evidence that they exist and that they're real and that there's somebody that you love. I'm paying attention to small beauties, whatever I have as if it were our duty to find things to love, to bind ourselves to this world. And that sentiment to bind ourselves to this world, what you get at the end here is this sentiment of 
this is what connects us to each other and connects us to the world of other people is those little things that we find to love about each other and the evidence of, of each other in our lives and those kinds of things. That this is how we know and love people is through these little artifacts and experiences um, and quirks and little behaviors like sunburns and spilling maple, a drop of maple syrup, these little things that we remember about each other. That, that gets us through the first three of these Sharon Olds poems. And if you go back to her response, you can see um, the ways that love or beauty is constructed. Well, little things gives you a good idea of that. The way love is constructed is through these little experiences, little, little moments of connection, little pieces of connection. Versus the way it's constructed, and I go back to May 1937, where it's this sort of resignation of y'all are going to do these bad things, but there's also love in it, and y'all are going to make me, and that's and that's that's great, that's wonderful, that's beautiful, and so there is this acceptance that things aren't going to be perfect, but sparks are going to be struck out of it. Some good is going to come out of it. Clearly, we will dive into three more Sharon Olds poems in part two of this, um, but that concludes. Uh, Sharon Olds Part 1, Sex Without Love. I go back to May 1937 and Little Things. Thank y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed that.